This is the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth, the 150th anniversary of the publication of Origins is on November 24th. This is the last photograph taken of Darwin, uh, only discovered about six years ago. Now, I consider Darwin the founder of psychology, the first scientific study of psychology. There's no doubt he's the founder of the psychology of emotion and of the face. Today, I'm going to focus on Darwin's view of compassion. I'm going to give you quite a few quotes from Darwin. Most of them are either from the 1838 notebook or from Descent of Man or from the letters uncovered by Darwin's great, great, great grandson, Randall Keynes, who wrote a wonderful book called Darwin, His Daughter, and Human Evolution. Quote, animals whom we have made our slaves we don't like to consider our equals. If we choose to let conjecture run wild, animals are our fellow brethren in pain, disease, death, and suffering, and famine, our slaves in the most laborious work, our companions in our amusements. We may all partake from our origin in one common ancestor. We may all be netted together. It's 1838. Another quote. This is from Descent. Man and the higher animals, especially the primates, have the same sense, intuitions, and sensations, similar passions, affections, and emotions, even the complex ones, such as jealousy, suspicion, emulation, gratitude, and magnanimity. Darwin talks about sympathy in what today we would call compassion, although computer searches have shown he doesn't use that word, compassion, although it was used in the English language of his time. Darwin again. The following proposition seems to me in high degree probable, namely, that any animal whatever endowed with well-marked social instincts, and filial affections, being here included, would inevitably acquire a moral sense or conscience as soon as its intellectual powers had become as well or nearly as well developed as in man. Note Darwin's emphasis on filial affections. He made, I think, a rightful exception. Don't look for sympathy in animals that never have contact with a parent. And there are such animals. Another wonderful quote, again from Descent. Several years ago, a keeper at the zoological gardens showed me some deep and scarcely healed wounds on the nape of his own neck, inflicted on him whilst kneeling on the floor by a fierce baboon. The little American monkey, that pleases me that he it was an American monkey, who was a warm friend of this keeper, lived in the same compartment, and was dreadfully afraid of the great baboon. This sounds like it's out of a children's book, doesn't it? <laughs> Nevertheless, as soon as he saw his friend in peril, he rushed to the rescue, and by screams and bites, so distracted the baboon that the man was able to escape after running great risk of his life. Now I'm going to skip over Franz de Waal's descriptions in contemporary literature of many similar events and raise the question, why would feelings of sympathy and compassion exist in animals? What's its origin? Darwin did not, like most scientists, just ask what, when, and where. He asked, why? Why is it in our makeup? How can we explain it? Quote, we are thus impelled to relieve sufferings of another in order that our own painful feelings may be at the same time relieved. The mere sight of suffering, independently of love, would suffice to call up in us vivid recollections and associations. 
You could, if you like, say this is a selfish motivation. Now, I'm going to quote from my recent book co-authored, The Dalai Lama. It's really not a book. It's a dialogue. It's presented as the conversation that exists. Now, this is the Dalai Lama. Compassion is focused on the suffering of the other, on the wish to see others free from suffering. In the human mind, seeing someone bleeding and dying makes you uncomfortable. That's the seed of compassion. In those animals like turtles, no dealing with the mother, I don't think they have the capacity to show affection. Okay, should remind you of Darwin. Buddhists, I'm still quoting, Buddhists understand that there is a developmental process for cultivating compassion for others beyond one's immediate boundaries. First, you have to have some knowledge, whether on the basis of reading or hearing. In Buddhism, it is considered the interdependent nature of one's interests and others' interests, the shared humanity, the fundamental equality of desiring happiness and overcoming suffering. So the first stage is knowledge. Then you need to reflect and internalize this knowledge through reflection, constant reflection or meditation to a point where it will become a conviction. It becomes integrated into your state of mind and you're deeply convinced of it. Then it becomes spontaneous. The moment you think about others, compassion becomes effortless. It's no longer at the level of thought. Compassion becomes infinite, unbiased, but only through training the mind. Emotions come spontaneously, but compassion, infinite compassion, only through training. This will get important. I'm pointing to Dacker because he knows what's coming next. In discussing how to extend compassion to all human beings, the Dalai Lama said, cultivating a state of mind that makes the sight of others suffering unbearable to you. Cultivation of that is the crucial component of compassion. You deliberately try to develop an attitude as dear as your own mother. <laughs>